uh, thank everyone that came. Our website crashed. So if people try to get this to the website, well, uh, it crashed. So there is something good and bad about it. The bad is that we probably have a third of the people we would have had otherwise. <clears throat> the good part about it is that if you want to ask me questions, there are less of you and it'll be easier for me to uh, um, ask, allow you to ask the question. Um, there are only so many topics that I can focus on in um, a short session that now became shorter because of the crashing of the internet. Uh, so I want to talk about a few things. You know, most of the function in the body is silent. Uh, the most silent thing is your blood flow. Now, uh, you could, um, uh, right now, be on a verge of a heart attack and you wouldn't know it. You could be just before a stroke and you wouldn't know it. And on the other end, um, you may be around 50 years from now in a pretty good health. And the difference is how your blood flows. One out of every eight people in the world, hear me well, a billion people have problems with their blood pressure. It's either too high or too low. Can I get some water? And uh, there are less problems with low blood pressure, although I've seen them all. I mean, people all of a sudden faint, lose consciousness, and not enough blood flows to different areas of the body. Um, but the biggest problems are with high blood pressure. The main known problems, of course, is cardiac arrest, uh, heart attacks, and, uh, um, and strokes. The problems I'm working with more than those, although I also work on many circulatory problems, are vision problems related to poor blood flow. And the two main corporates are high blood pressure or diabetes. And both of them leads to more or less the same result of bleeding in the retina, in my opinion, glaucoma results from that and many other problems. So I want to talk first of all about uh, low blood pressure. What should we do about it? Uh, it may sound something that many people don't want to do. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, it may sound like something that most people don't want to do, but I recommend for people with low blood pressure uh, to take several cold showers. Now, in this time in the world, except the world I live in, which is in San Francisco, uh, which is a cold place, but almost everywhere in the northern hemisphere of the world, people have heat waves and it's hot. So it's no problem. So in a hot day like this, it's good to take once a day hot and cold shower just to bring the uh, polarities to expand the muscles and relax them and to take away inflammation. But it's good at the same time to take four or five short cold showers. Just jump in for a minute, even 45 seconds, make sure the whole body cools and then jump out. It's also very good for the eyes if we lie down and we put a cold towel around the eyes. It's also very good for the neck if you put something cold under the neck four or five times a day. That makes more difference than you could imagine and it can uh, prevent you from needing uh, medical care, actually, and can prevent you from any other problems. Now, high blood pressure is a whole different story. Again, I recommend in days like today to take cold uh, showers. But I want to tell you that anyone who has a tendency for high blood pressure, like I do, uh, it's very mandatory that you would walk at least four, if not five times a week. Today, I walked in the park. A few days ago, when it was warmer, I was uh, walking and running 
on the beach, it's much nicer. But I think walking becomes very, very important, no matter what weight, weight groups you're in. And the important thing is uh, that when we walk, that we will not only walk in one way. So um, uh, walking forwards, we have to make sure that we walk heel to toe. I have a very small space here in this room to show it. You can see that. So heel to toe when we walk forwards. And then we can walk backwards and it not naturally becomes toe to heel. Toe to heel. So when I walk forwards, it's always heel to toe. And um, put it here, yeah. And when I walk backwards, it's always toe to heel. And then there is sideways walk, where we basically curve the foot from side to side. This is so good for the back and uh, for the legs. So a nice exercise for us will be everybody walk forwards, heel to toe in your room. Now walk backwards and then walk forwards again, heel to toe. And then walk backwards. I'll give this to you. Thank you. So, again, run forwards, run backwards, run forwards, heel to toe, run backwards. And again, run forwards. Run backwards. And you can do the same thing sideways. Sideways. Now, it's hard for me to show it easily in the small room we have here. I mean, it's not that small, but relatively. Um, in our classroom, it's easier. And of course, on the beach, which is the biggest room we have in our place, it's the easiest to go sideways like this. And when you walk, you think as if the floor is like a trampoline. It's like, as you walk, you think like the floor pushes you back. So in fact, what I want you to do is make something easy, easier. So if you start to feel your relationship to the floor, and as you walk, you feel like the floor also pushes you forwards and backwards, right? And the floor also pushes you sideways, makes a huge difference because many, uh, many of us feel kind of heavy as we walk and we could actually feel very light as we walk, but we feel heavy often throughout the day. So this is one good exercise, but then I want to show you another one and you tell me if people see me or not. I guess I have to move the pillows out of here uh, to stand more on the side. Sorry about that. We have lots of pillows in this room because people exercise here. Okay, so I'm standing. Am I okay? Yeah. Oh, do you need to point the camera? No, you're good. you're good. I'm good. Okay. Thank God for Kyle who can um, show me things. Too bad we didn't succeed to revive the internet, but uh, you're lucky. Okay, so anyway, let's put it this way. To reduce blood pressure, we have to make sure that the blood flows to our hands and our feet. Because cold hands and feet is one of the main things that shows you about full blood pressure. So first of all, open and close your hands. Second of all, stamp on your legs, right? So basically, you want to bring blood to your feet, then there is less of a work for the heart. I mean, the whole thing is that the pressure against the heart is so high that at the end of the day, what happens as a result of that pressure is that the heart fails. The pressure is so high that not enough blood gets pushed to, to places. So opening and closing your hands, stamping is very important. So now lifting the arms one by one against the wall, opposite and the legs and doing it quickly. That's a fantastic thing to do. 
fantastic thing to do. So we can just lift it up and down as quickly as we can. And let's count 30 of those, right? And as quickly as you can. And by the way, don't stop breathing. Yeah. Um, so that's a very important thing for me to tell to all of you that you want to push your blood to your hands and feet. So to talk more about that, I would say that we should have some good signs and symptoms for our blood flow. Again, we don't know whether the blood flows well or not. It is silent. But there's some things that we can know in our life without any instrument that shows us what happens to the blood. One, if you feel fatigue, it means your blood doesn't flow well. So taking away fatigue in natural way, not with coffee or uh, ice cream or um, stimulant, but taking away fatigue in different ways, with whether it is rest or whether it is a nice physical activity, well, that's a fantastic thing for you. So uh, that's number one. Number two, you could feel very rigid. And to some extent, it's objective. If you cannot bend down and touch the floor, you're rigid. But feeling rigid is also very subjective. You could have a teacher of yoga who can put her two legs behind her head I, I, the best I've done it in the past when I was in my 20s and 30s, putting one leg behind my head. But you can put two legs behind your head, but today you're a bit more rigid. That means today, in this minute, the blood doesn't flow so well. You could um, be an athletic client who can hardly bend and touch his or her knees. But today you can actually go a little bit beyond your knees and still you look very rigid comparing to that uh, a very uh, flexible yoga teacher and still your blood flows well right now. So being loose relatively to yourself means you allow much better channels of circulation in your body. And um, if your shoulders and hip joints are stiff, it means your blood doesn't flow well. If your hands and feet are uh, cold, often it means the blood doesn't flow well. That goes together, by the way. Loosening the hip joints and loosening the shoulders allows the blood to flow much, much better. And um, I would like to uh, continue the principles of blood flow, but I want to do some exercise that can bring more uh, circulation to the hands. I mean, our time is kind of short, but we need to accomplish some interesting things. So, uh, you know, what's, what's really interesting is that we are used to flex our fingers, means shorten the space of the joints, but we don't extend them enough. So for example, if you can extend your fingers right now for one minute, Alexa, tell me when one minute is over. One minute, 39. Okay, so for one minute, you stretch your fingers. And it sounds like a very easy to do exercise till you do it. See what it takes for you to do one minute. It's very easy to plunge the fingers for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But the imbalance is, can you actually extend your fingers for one minute at great ease. So go ahead, stretch. Stretch the fingers and see how it feels. And breathe deeply and breathe slowly. 
Breathe deeply and breathe slowly. So Carl, do you, do you give up on the website for now or do you want to check it once yeah. more? Yeah. It'd be great if you can check it for a second. I mean, yeah. so we stretch. Okay, Alexa, stop. That was one minute. So let's now move each finger in rotating motion in both directions. And we move the second finger in rotating motion in both directions. And there's much more into this exercise, but again, there's so much we can do right now. And you can move the third finger in rotating motion in both directions. The fourth is the toughest one, musicians can actually do it, but it's hard for us. And the fifth finger in rotating motion in both directions and open and close your hands. Now move your wrist in rotating motion in both directions. And move your forearm in rotating motion in both directions. And now move your shoulder in rotating motion in both directions. Tap on the tip of your shoulder and move your shoulder in rotating motion in both directions. And now move your whole arm in rotating motion in both directions and tap with your fingertips on your thigh or on a, a, on a chair if you have a chair with arms that i don't hear so tap and tap and tap now see how it feels to open and close the hands compare between the two hands you feel the difference We'll do exactly the same thing on the other hand. So move your thumb in rotating motion in both directions. Move the, uh, the first finger in rotating motion in both directions, the middle finger. Move the fourth again. The fourth is going to be a tough thing. Easy to move the index, hard to move the fourth. And move the fifth finger in rotating motion in both directions. And move the wrist in rotating motion in both directions. And move the forearm in rotating motion in both directions. And now the shoulder, tap on the tip of the shoulder and move the shoulder in rotating motion in both directions. And you can move the two hands in rotating motion in both directions. So one thing I wanna to talk to you about is um, People fall a lot and get injured a lot. It's, uh, we really need to find a way to help ourselves to recover from the injury. So if you fell on your wrist, it's nice to massage the wrist. Uh, one injury that reoccurs with so many people are knee injuries. And I found out, by the way, that the best treatment for me is comfrey. And it's wonderful to take Comfrey cream and uh, to um, uh, th this is just a massage cream, but comfrey cream is way better. I have it in my home near my couch. 
and do, do people see me well massaging my knees, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. All the way. And so, for example, you massage your hands and then give yourself a minute. I always uh, uh, give myself a timer. Maybe right now, uh, Carl, you can give us a timer of two minutes to massage the knees. Almost everybody needs to massage the knees. We, we put pressure on our legs and then so many people injure their knees, but they're not touching them enough. They ice them, they elevate the legs, but they don't touch the knees enough. And the more we touch the knees, the better it is. So now just for about a minute or two, all I want you to do is to massage and warm your knees. What a difference it can make for you. What a difference. And breathe deeply and slowly. Slowly and deeply. You see, even though we have a short session, I want you to leave the session with some tips in your life. You know, when people take a workshop with me, they have so many tips, and we record the workshop on an MP3. It's not um, uh, MP4. We don't record it uh, like um, on video, although people can make videos for themselves. But what we do, we record audio, and you then can sit down at home and write notes in a workshop for three days. It can be a year or two years' worth of work on yourself which could change your life completely. It's just such a life change for people who have some pain in the knees to just touch them and work them and help them. And those who don't have pain, to warm the knees all they can. So I think that Kyle gives me a hint that the minute is over, right? 15 seconds. 15 seconds left. All right, sorry. So we keep massaging. Wonderful. Okay. Probably feels lighter in the knee. So let me just finish all the principles of um, blood circulation. And uh, from there on, we move to one or two movements for the joints. And right after that, we work on the eyes. So as I said, if you're fatigued, it means the blood doesn't flow well. If you're refreshed, it means it does. And if it becomes chronic fatigue, that's a problem. And that's something that we address quite a bit in our work. If you feel stiff, no matter what your point of looseness is, it means your circulation is not that good. If you feel loose, it's all different. Um, if you feel energized, it means your blood flows well. If you breathe slowly and deeply, it means your blood flows well. So breathing has everything to do with blood flow. Um, if uh, you feel heavy, that means your blood is not flowing well. If you feel light, you flow well. If you're clear in your thoughts, it means the blood flows well. Doesn't happen to you often that you just lost the line of thought that you had. That is definitely an indication of poor blood flow for this moment. So sometimes we should exercise and we should find the times of the day where exercising feels good. In my case, my best time to walk or run is morning. Oh man, it's asking me to speak a little louder. Right. Can you make it louder? I can't make it louder. I'm not in. Can you put the camera a bit more tilted towards me? Okay, good. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, uh, sometimes, and somebody wants to be admitted, I think, right? Sometimes, uh, what's important for us uh, is to exercise in a time that works for our body. Many people exercise without checking if that's when the body wants it. 
And often it is during lunch break that people exercise and the body is not ready for it. Now, um, I would say that for me, the morning is the best to exercise in because I slept and the body is rested and it's easier to exercise, but not before I do a long session of pounding, as I've shown right now. Listen to my favorite podcast or book and I palm, but first of all, I visualize darkness, if not blackness, and I feel the full movement. So just be aware of the fact that sometimes rest is better than exercise. So for example, if you have a long day, instead of loading yourself with more exercises, lying down for 10 minutes, closing your eyes, and have, even having one minute of sleep would take away fatigue that would build up throughout the day. So whatever gets your hands and feet warmer and nose, I would say, and whatever makes you lighter and more flexible is what helps your blood to flow better. And that's why it's so important to address it because half of the people die from cardiovascular problems. And if you ask me about 30 years before they should, we should really find a way to prevent that. And there is no formula except following our circulation, sensing what circulation helps us. So I want to, uh, since we massage the knees, I want to continue and I want all of you to take, um, to take a, a, a blanket or a yoga mat and to lie on the floor. As long as it can also either follow my voice or if you can follow um, uh, the guidance that I'm showing. Um, someone asked if you could repeat what you said from whatever makes your hands and feet warmer. Yeah. It looks like we're kind of cutting out a bit. So what I want to say is whether it is rest or whether it is movement. If you feel as a result of rest in the middle of the day, let's say you rested for eight or 10 minutes, like a cat nap, slept for a minute, and you woke up with warmer hands and feet, now your blood flows better. If you pushed yourself and allow yourself to be fatigued the whole day, then your blood decreased in its ability the whole day. Now the question is, can your body withstand the decreased blood flow? and mostly does, and then there are times when it simply doesn't, and that's when we see you for all kinds of problems. On the other end, if you loosen up your joints, like we did the subtle work on our knees, the subtle work on our shoulders, the subtle work on our hands, that made a big difference. Every morning I exercise, but never before I sit down and pound for at least half an hour, listening to my favorite podcast or to a book. Okay, I repeated myself. I won't do it again. All right. So, um, I want you all, tell me if everybody sees me or not. I want you all to lie on your stomach. Do people see my legs? Yes. Okay. So now, choose a leg. Let's say the left leg. You bend your knee. You move your foot in rotating motion in both directions. We move the whole leg in rotating motion in both directions. And we visualize that the foot is doing the work. And you put the leg down and you can feel that the leg is longer, isn't it? So again, same left leg, bend the leg, move the foot in rotating motion. Move your leg or your calf in rotating motion in both directions. Then lift the leg up, again, the left leg alone, stand on all fours and lift the leg up, bend 
and move it in rotating motion, both directions. And breathe. And right now, again, bend your left leg and move it in rotating motion in both directions. And put it down. Do you feel how longer the left leg is? The, and that shows you how function affects structure. Now we'll do the next thing. You bend your right leg in rotating motion. So you bend your right leg and you move your foot in rotating motion. You move your foot in rotating motion in both directions. Now we move the leg in rotating motion. in both directions. Now you lift the leg up. Keep it up a little bit. And you can move your leg that way too. Now you stand on all fours. Lift the leg up. Move your leg in rotating motion. And now you lie down on the floor, bend your knee, and move the leg in rotating motion in both directions. Bend both knees and move them both in rotating motion in both directions. Now, this is a small sample exercise that I've shown you how we don't use many of the muscles that exist for us. And we use only few out of the muscles that exist. 80% of the people in all my classes, when they lie on the floor and they move one leg in rotating motion, it becomes longer. In fact, when you move both legs, they truly are becoming longer because the hold of the thigh muscles on your knee that shorten the space between the hip and the knee, that those muscles have to relax to allow the other muscles to work. And so I want to make this simple statement, and this is that function affects structure and that uh, thought affects function. And in this, I want to open uh, the floor for a question or two, if somebody has it quickly, and then we'll move straight to work on vision. So anyone who wants to talk, please unmute yourself and ask a question. We have a small group, so it's going to be easy. Nobody asked a question. I have a comment. I wanted to say how nice it felt. I felt the circulation back on my feet that I, in an area like right below the ankle, I didn't even realize it was stiff, but it started tingling. And so I realized now how low circulation was there. <laughs> Wonderful. And keep being vigilant with yourself and work so you will have good circulation all the time. So you and I can speak again in 50 years. How about that? Huh? Um, I did have a question. Um, I also want to say how much that helped me. It's kind of not quite aligned. It helped tremendously. So thank you for that. It's amazing. Um, my question, though, is I believe I have visual snow. Will any types of your eye therapy help that? I really don't understand what causes that. Well, to a great extent, it's a problem with the vitreous, and my therapy can definitely help that. Definitely. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, so a couple of questions were asked, a couple of comments were made, so that's great. Let's talk right now about vision. Um, I think that many of you know my history, but let me just brief you on that one, and that is that me and my kids, we were born with cataracts. 
In my case, I was born with cataracts and my surgeries were very unsuccessful. And 99% um, uh, of my lens is scar tissue. And I was known as the dead son of Ida and Abraham, who were uh, very known in the deaf club in Tel Aviv. So I was known as the blind son. I was actually a good kid. My mother would take me uh, when she met with her girlfriend's gathering. And I would be sunk in a Braille book. I would just read the book. I read the book after book after book. And um, uh, that's how my life were in, in the beginning of my life. And I really believe that you don't change unless there's enough pain, unless you feel not okay about where you're at. And then you will give yourself this, the um, motivation and the impetus to change. So I dreamt about a surgery that will save me. And while I was walking uh, uh, to the same hospitals and the same doctors that were so nice to me when they did all the surgeries, everybody said, there's nothing we can do. And they were right. There's nothing they could have done. At that point, when 99% of my lens is like a glass you step on and shatter it, why should they think there's anything to be done? But it was even more than what they understood. My brain did not perceive what seeing is. That's the difference between me and my kids. Their surgery was better, and it was done much earlier when they were infants. It doesn't always work. I just met somebody who had surgery on time and still has very poor vision. We have improved it to some extent. And she came all the way from um, South America to work with me. But truth is that uh, I would have still have my blind certificate for good, which in Israel, uh, the government issue you many uh, benefits like free phones and uh, free electricity and things of that nature. I still would have had my blind certificate for good. But these days, all, I only have it as a document. I drive. Okay. Mm -hmm. I must say the laws in California are kind of relaxed about it comparing to other laws due to the uh, old people's lobby. But that benefits me and I'm able to drive. While in the past, people thought I should walk with a seeing eye dog. So that's my story, and much more of it is written in my book, um, uh, Vision for Life, and of course in my book, Movement for Self-Healing, which is available uh, in our store, and you can definitely get them and work with them. But I want to talk to you about vision as vision. What we need to a great extent is to wake up the central uh, part of our visual system, which means the macula. Uh, we need to wake up the macula and to get that macula, which is only a very small spot in our retina, to look at details. And what we need to do is uh, to, um, uh, to look at many smaller details than we tend to see, but without straining to see. Now to get there, it, it, it sounds kind of simplistic until you train yourself to do it. And today I'm not going to work on that. I will definitely, uh, I definitely worked on it in other courses online and I worked on it uh, in my, um, uh, I work on it in my uh, uh, workshops. But the most important thing is that Looking at details is a part of your total vision. So let's talk about your vision, okay? So the first question that one should ask always is, how am I doing? So we talked about circulation. Well, if you feel bad, if you feel malaise, if you feel tense, then that is a very difficult space from which you can see well. So how you feel and how you see do go hand in hand. 
you cannot see as well with a headache. You cannot see as well, even if you have good vision that could be measured uh, when you're occupied with thoughts. You cannot see as well when you're disturbed. So this is a very, very important thing. You know, how I feel is very, very important. Second part to it is the question of where am I? Now you're going to love it. I'm sitting right now in a room, right? Uh, I have a nice guy by the name of Kyle who sits near me, uh, supervising the uh, internet. Uh, that doesn't work, right? <laughs> um, but at least we're right here. Uh, and you sit in your room and you know your room well. So why should one ask the question, where am I? Well, just be aware of the fact that we're in rooms only for a few hundreds of years. And for two million years, we always need to know where we are. The jungle was not a safe territory. I mean, there's a jungle of traffic these days, that's not safe either, but, but that is a choice that we have. We, we sit behind the wheel and go with traffic. But your, your question always is, um, should be, where am I? And not asking that question is a problem. It's like the eyes want you to ask that question and you're not asking it. So it's always good to visit your walls, to visit your pictures, to visit your mess. If you have a mess, I'm not even asking you to clear your mess. Look at it, you know, to just know where you are daily. And then comes the question is, what is the object I'm looking at? What is it? And again, you will say to me, well, I'm looking right now at the internet. I'm looking at you online. What are you talking about? Or I'm reading a book. Of course, I know what it is. It's a book. But again, if you take a look at uh, tribes that have fantastic vision, they always curiously ask, what is it? So the problem is we got to a place where we picture paragraphs and whole pages and we don't really want to look at the small areas that we need to see. So having a sense of our total periphery opens the way to start to look at details. And again, I would like to say that this Labor Day, I have a three-day workshop, which will give me the chance to thoroughly go with you over those elements. But right now, before I open the, the floor for questions, uh, I want you to know that the periphery is something you don't look at, you only see. So, for example, movement is something you see. So if you wave your hands to the side and maybe beyond the view of your screen and have a sense of your hand, now you use your periphery. And you can put one hand over one eye and move your hand in rotating motion and you look straight, now you use your periphery, but you don't look at your hand. And maybe you should move away from the screen so you don't look at anything at your hand at the screen, right? And you move it in rotating motion, do exactly the same thing on the other side. You wave and wave, move up and down and move your hands like this and wave and wave and wave. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, we can put a small paper between the eyes and wave the hands up and down. Up and down. That way, and in fact, you can stand in the room and you can walk and have a sense that the room is here. So maybe I, I jumped a little bit. So let me make the step. Take masking tape and take two pieces of paper, one large and one small, and put that masking tape on those papers. 
And now you can put it right between your eyes. You can take the masking tape and put a masking tape also on the large paper. We have sent you an email with those two papers, yeah. right? Yes. Okay, good. And the big piece of paper will have another um, work to do with balls. But at this point, all I'm asking is to put those papers. So now let's say you did it. So now wave your hands near and then far and look straight at the paper. And you can stand up and walk and do that. So we wave and wave and wave with our hands. And now you take the small one off and you put the big one on and you wave and wave and wave and wave below and wave above and move the hands all around as you look straight at your paper. And in fact, grab your hands and palm with the paper on for just a breath. And then wave your hands again to the side. And now put the small piece of paper on. And the question I want to ask you, is the small paper smaller right now? So that becomes a very, very great exercise. And especially since now people are looking right now at the phones or the computers, well, as you do that, uh, you forget that there is a wall. You forget there is a floor. You forget there is a ceiling. You only look at your instrument. Well, that narrows your view. So while eventually what I want to teach you is to look at details, and that's how I overcame my blindness, by the way, because I used to read Braille, and my teacher used to tell me, don't look at what you read, you don't see anyway. So that was like a very bad subconscious order. And then I learned, it was good that I learned to feel separately. I learned to start and look when I was a little bit less than 17 years of age, while all of you learned to look when you were eight weeks of age, very different. And that's what my kids benefited from, and they benefit until today. So now I want to put, um, like this. And like this, the big piece of paper. So all of you, you can put it in the middle, but also from the two sides. And take with yourself a small ball. Could be a tennis ball, could be a colored ball, could be anything that you want. But a ball that it's easy for you to hold in your hand. Right? Yeah, could be either a ball this size or this size, yeah? And take the ball, clap your hand and throw it from hand to hand. It's easier for me to handle a tennis ball when I do that. So the thing is that in one eye, you are looking at the ball. I'm standing at the side, so I won't see myself on the screen. So I'm looking at the ball. The other eye looks at the ball. So don't look at the screen, but just look at the ball. And then you kind of work like an arch. You start here, go, clap your hand and catch. Here, go, clap your hand and catch. And you can even walk or run in place and catch. Right. And we can walk or run in place and catch. Now, this is not peripheral exercise because you're following the ball. The peripheral exercise, you look straight and you wave your hand to the side. You can still even do it with this way. This is a central vision exercise. I'm following the ball, but here's what happens. If I close my left eye and my ball is in front of the left eye, I won't see the ball. If I put the ball in front of the right eye, close my right eye, I won't see the ball. So what I'm doing is I'm throwing the ball from hand to hand above the head. And I breathe deeply and slowly. I 
Okay, so this is an important thing. All right, let's take this off and see how more relaxed your eyes are now. And now I'm opening the floor for questions. How many people do we have here? 82. 82. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all for coming. I mean, it's nice to get 82 people when your website is down. Just think how many would have if the website was on. So anyway, um, anyone who wants to ask a question, I'm here to answer. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I always thought what? that was I always thought that was a peripheral vision question when you throw the ball from hand to hand. No, no. When you throw oh. the ball from hand to hand, it's a question of independence of the two eyes. Oh, like okay. you you stop one eye from being the one that looks for both because it cannot look on the other side. But you follow the ball. The periphery you can do with that periphery. You can wave your hands to the side. But this is a, a thing of separating them so one will not control the other. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. Next question. Anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question? There, I have a question. Um, this is a detail. Um, in your book, you know, I have your books. You say to breathe in eight and breathe out 11. And on this video, you've said on this class, you've said breathe in seven and out 10. Is that, does it make a difference that one? Not really, not really. The only thing okay. you want to know is that you breathe slowly and that uh, the inhalation is slow, but the exhalation is even slower. So the idea uh, is thank you. you want to exhale slowly, and I'll tell you exactly why, because then your brain demands for you to inhale. Uh, in the uh. brain stem, the medulla wants you to inhale, and the pons want you to exhale. So if you exhale, uh, then the body wants to inhale. And one of the ways that you can kill people with, with uh, compassion if you give emphysema patients too much oxygen, even though they're 50% of the oxygen that they need in their blood, but if you give them too much oxygen, they die because the medulla doesn't have the need to get you to inhale. So mm -hmm. slow down your breathing, both inhalation and exhalation, and the exhalation is slower than the inhalation. Thank you. Um, looks like Victoria has a question. See your hand up. Yeah, um, I was going for uh, I have vertical and horizontal. Um, I can't even think of the word now. My eyes in. <laughs> um, so, do the are the exercises for um, cross eye, like lazy eye? Are they the same for vertical and horizontal? Will they will that correct them both? They are very very similar, and they will correct them both. Okay. Because the point is to connect between your brain and the eye. If you have specific weakness in your muscles of the eye, uh, and so we have to work on those specific muscles. So they're, they're different. But basically the idea is to not let one eye be lazy, which means not let the brain overuse one eye at the expense of the other. And in fact, that exercise, we put the paper between the eyes, I call it the Melissa exercise, and throw it from hand to hand above the head and clap the hands and all that. That leads to independence of the eyes. And that's the beginning. And then we have other exercise with red and green glasses. We have, well, even the peripheral exercise are good for it because the two eyes work more evenly. But uh, I would say exercises with body work is a real good connection. Okay. I, I find with the peripheral exercises that the left eye, which is the lazy eye, it just doesn't bother. It just goes on a holiday looking at my nose. So what you do then is you close the right eye for a short moment and you wave your hand to the side and then you open the right eye again. So if we had a private session, I would work on that. Okay. And so this is probably a private session question. So it'll be quick, I expect. Um, my right eye is my dominant eye, but it's weaker by about two diopters. Um, so I get when I start trying to do the exercises, I get a bit confused and, and I have cataract in that eye because it's the one staring at the screen all the time. So then I get confused where to start with the cataract, the floaters, the lazy eye, the 
myopia. <laughs> in peripheral exercise and in looking at a distance. Okay, great. Okay, all right. Okay, Cayenne. Cayenne, you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, there she goes. Why won't we have the next person? Let's well, look like she's here. Cayenne? Oh, it looks like her audio is up. Okay, we'll come back to you, Cayenne. I can't um can't hear you. Um, Marvel Lambert. Yes, thank you. This is my first um, class joining or webinar. I've been reading much about you and I really appreciate your time. I just wanted to ask, is this the initial class or first class with more to come or did I took a seminar that's already in the middle of others? No, this is just uh, uh, an introductory class because we're going to have a workshop on Labor Day weekend uh or second through the fourth and we would like people to have a taste of the work uh we have many webinars which we sell online that is when our website will stop being crushed right mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point the website doesn't allow us to do that um, but uh, we have webinars online um i did not do a series of uh sessions yet I may. The only problem I have is I travel so much and teach in so many countries that, and I'm not technically technically advanced. So it would be hard for me uh, until I will grow up and start to do it from everywhere and anywhere, uh, because that's what the internet is. Uh, uh, some regular weekly workshops. But at this point, we don't have them weekly. We have them at times when we announce them. And today we got less people because our internet is down. So that's that's great. But we'll have another one in August with uh, the Living Smart People, right? On August 8th, I think. Yeah, August 8th with um, Silicon Valley Health Institute. With, uh, si uh, uh, yeah, Kyle told us with the Silicon Valley Health Institute, there'll be another uh, uh, introduction as we had today. Uh, of course, I always talk about something different. It depends what interests me right now. It has to do with the clients I've seen lately. So you will always learn new things. So that would, that would be a webinar, the one in August? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the one in September is live? Live, yes. Okay. Yeah. The, you the, don't have the, the Zoom option for those, for someone to be remote. Well, the, the reason, I mean, I did do Zoom classes in the past, and I'm, as I'm saying, they're still for sale. They're recorded. Uh, oh. The reason is I want personal touch. And you're like, when you palm and I have few assistants, we go and we massage your shoulders, right? Uh, and uh, I cannot take you to the beach. Uh, Kyle won't let me take you to the beach. He says, it's too noisy, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I can't take you to the beach uh, to, uh, to throw balls and eye charts is part of what we do. Well, I can do it in a workshop, you know? So, I like to do it live, but uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for your request. And I will definitely consider one of these days to do regular classes online, which would be a nice thing that many other people do as well. So I will definitely do that. Uh, and I wanna make sure that you're on our mailing list so we can always let you know. But remember August 8th is gonna be another free class. And also, Mary, your books are wonderful. So those are helpful too. If people can't get to you or, or don't have, you know, if when you're not doing the webinars, those are full of good reminders and good information. I put all my energy in those books. I will uh, correct the indexing of uh, Awakening, but Awakening is also a good book with 600 exercises, 28 chapters in both. Uh, accompanying you to prevent problems and to uh, increase vitality and also follow you when you have a problem. Uh, for example, if somebody has uh, uh, muscular atrophy from lying in bed a lot, I always encourage them to move very slowly, otherwise they can injure their muscles. 
I talk about what you do with arthritis and give you wonderful pool exercises. But be cautious of warm pool. On the one end, it lengthens your muscles. And on the other end, it can increase your inflammation. So I say something unpopular. Every 10 or 15 minutes, go and take a short cold shower, and especially in your joints. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm talking from strokes to headaches to heart conditions, and of course, vision conditions in that book. So I would really recommend that you take it like a dictionary uh, for the rest of your life and work with it. Okay. Are there any other questions? If so, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a question. Can we get a link to this webinar? Yes, this will be posted to our YouTube channel, and I will also send it out to our email list. Um, and if you are not on our email list, please contact me at production at self-healing.org, and I will add you to our email list. I want to tell you that uh, Kyle, besides being a nice guy, he's very technically savvy. Although today he wasn't able to do the miracle of putting the internet back in place. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, hello. Hello. I'm listening. Thanks, Nicole. First of all, I want to thank you so much for your time and your energy and you're willing to do this for free to us. It's just, it's wonderful. I've been doing yoga for your eyes for about 20 years. And as I'm getting a little older now, I'm noticing my vision. I haven't been keeping up with it as much as I should, uh, but my vision as I'm using technology more, um, I'm needing more magnification. And I was just wondering if the exercises you gave us, the ball throwing one, I really struggled with, by the way. Um, and I have a history of macular degeneration in our family. So I was wondering if the, even just going to do those, uh, the ball throwing a little more and such would help with the, the acuity and the sharpness uh, when I'm reading on a screen and actually reading books and such. Absolutely. And the one thing I'd really recommend that you do is read my book, Vision for Life. And I'm you can actually, also hear it. You have it? Okay. I'm in the middle of that. Yes. I'm in. The, so your timing with this free webinar was just a blessing. Wonderful. Uh, so, so, so one thing I like to suggest is look at the distance a lot. Uh, you know, we had to do a huge fight to get uh, uh, a home that I own near the beach to uh, in a residential area uh, to allow us to conduct our work here. And uh, we were able to do it. it. took us five years. It was a lot of work. But um, uh, what, what is nice is that we use the waves to look at a distance. And you can use anything. If you have waves, that's where you look. If you have mountains, that's where you look. Otherwise, you can look at the sky. But looking at a distance is relaxing for the eyes. I'll give you a real good example, which doesn't belong to us. But um, the Israeli army has uh, uh, Bedouins that, uh, that uh, help the army. And they only do one thing. They observe the desert, the Sinai desert. And they can see any movement that happens there. When you take all those Jewish kids that look at computers from the age of three or four, they don't have anything like the vision of the Bedouins. So the Bedouins call them when they see some movement uh, of Al-Qaeda or something in the desert, and the Bedouins can stop them. Uh, sorry, and the Israeli army stops them. Uh, we also um, get many people who come illegally to Israel, but there they tell them which lawyer to call. That's that's a different thing. <laughs> but uh, that's that's an interesting thing. Those Bedouins have unbelievable vision. People in the Amazon, you know, for them, their vision is amazing. But we lose our vision looking at computers all the time. And lately, there's a very big issue that there's a lot of nearsightedness because of the... Uh, because of the pandemic that we had. Uh, and the biggest problem of the pandemic, in my opinion, was losing our vision, was looking at too many uh, things online, reading too much online. And eventually, that really weakens the eyes a lot. And even doctors, now they're not the smartest, 
about those things, but they're saying it now, that go and play outdoors. So my request from you is every day look 20 minutes at a distance. Four minutes, six minutes, four minutes, six minutes. It is so hard. Even when I got people uh, uh, in Big Sur, there was an institute by the name of Esalen where I took people in the past too. When I got them to look at beauty like the ocean, like rocks, they lost their patience trying to see it for four minutes. It sounds little until you do it. So 20 minutes a day, you look at the distance <clears throat> in intervals in four and six minutes, you work on your periphery, you work on that exercise that we did, and you have a very, very big start in being able to combat the looking at the screen. Other than that, we have to meet and talk. Indeed, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Someone in the chat asked how to improve nystagmus. Well, it's interesting that my nystagmus used to be 300 movements per minute. Means I would try to look to the left, the eyes would move to the right, they would move wherever I wouldn't want them to move. The most known person with nystagmus is Stevie Wonder, basically. Uh, but mine was even worse than his. Um, uh, the way you stop nystagmus is, first of all, with palming that we have brought in the beginning of, the, of this session. And the other one is that you look in the mirror. Uh, so I cannot show it to you properly here, but like um, I've done it several times. I look in the mirror in good light between the two eyes because you cannot see the nystagmus if you look at one eye because the, the eye would move with you. But if you look between the two eyes, then you, you peripherally see the nystagmus. And you see the, the, the effect that the eyes are shaking. Well, when you see it, the brain stops it automatically. See, the brain just follows things. But when the brain senses that there is irregularity, this is, by the way, what I've done also with people with other problems, see your irregularity. Don't try to get rid of it. And then the brain fixes it. So basically, what I do often, I look between my eyes. And I see the eyes stopping. And there are many more exercises to head uh, in that direction of nystagmus. But, uh, and there are several reasons for nystagmus. But definitely, this work is the only answer for nystagmus. Okay, and one more question in the chat says, what is a good exercise for cataracts? So uh, the issue of cataracts, it's so prevalent these days, you know. Um, to begin with, do anything you can do to prevent it from happening, because basically it's decay of your lens. Don't be too comfortable with your inability to see print uh, without glasses. Don't be too comfortable in using glasses for driving. Start to work on your eyes so they'll be more vital. Just like I ask you to have better vital blood flow, have better vital eyes. Uh, but there's no formula. The main exercise I recommend for cataracts is distance viewing. It is in my book, Vision for Life, a distance viewing. That's why, you know, one of the things we're going to do in our seminar is work a lot on distance viewing. So you look at the sky and then you look at the horizons and then you look closer and closer because pay attention to something. Well, if you look out of the window for a second, look out of the window, right? Then look at your hand near your nose. And again, look out of the window. And again, at your hand near your nose. And again, out of the window. And you can see that looking out of the window is easier than looking at something near because it's so straining the muscles to look from near. And what happens is the muscles of the lens, the ciliary muscles, constrict and make the lens round when you are reading and they expand and relax. And there's a ligament, the suspensory ligament that makes the lens flat. And by the way, uh, it connects to the neck. I don't think you can really loosen the neck all the way unless you also look at the distance. And you know, inter-urban driving is not 
anything that helps because you look actually rather near or few hundreds of yards away. But if you drive cross country and you go to many forgotten roads and look far the distance, miles and miles, without any car near you, that's the time that you actually benefit from driving. Otherwise, you don't benefit from it that much. So without driving, without doing anything particular, sit down and look at the distance. If you have beginning of cataract, 40 minutes a day, eight minutes times five. If you don't have cataract, then 20 minutes a day, four minutes, six minutes, four minutes, six minutes, etc. Okay. Okay. Um, looks so, like Mayor, I, I have a question about the difference between resting your eyes and looking in the distance, because it seems like resting your eyes would also relax the lens if you're palming or just with your eyes closed. So what's the, is there a difference? You know, when you, when, palm, you when you palm, you don't only rest the eyes, you nurture the eyes, you bring more blood to the eyes. So for example, all of us, put your hands around the eye orbits for, for a moment, and you can feel that your mind is on your eyes. Uh, put your hands <clears> on your <throat> belly for a moment, and your mind is in your belly. Put your hands on your chest, your mind is on your chest. So <clears> basically, <throat> So basically, it's a form of bringing more blood there. Now, you have to learn to not need to see. There's a difference between needing to see and looking. For example, I had a mm. girl with something like 8% vision, but she could see the waves moving. And that relaxed her eyes, just looking at the waves moving. Um, my daughter in the past, with a stronger eye, I could see the wave moving, but not with the weaker eye. And so we did several exercises of her looking with both eyes and then her weaker eye, and then she could see the waves moving. That movement meant a lot to her development, uh, visual development, which ended up being very successful. Uh, she's now 30, and instead of being legally blind, she has normal vision. So what I'm saying is this. Um, looking at the distance in a soft manner flattens the lens. When you palm, you relax everything, but you relax through, uh, uh, through deep nurturing and relaxation. But then you have to convert it into looking at a distance and whether it's near or far, learning to look at details without straining to see them. You want to adjust to strong light as well. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that there's balanced use of the eyes. And we want to make sure as we talk today that it is good periphery. Thank you. So does it matter? Like sometimes I just close my eyes like if I'm washing my hands, I don't need to look. So I close my eyes. Is that helpful? Does Always. that do anything? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Looks like Karen has a question. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this has been great, Mayor. And my, I have actually two questions. And one of them is we're asymmetrical, right? I mean, we're right-handed. We're So for your eyes, are you striving also for sym symmetry? I'm striving for, uh, for balance, not symmetry. Ah. You always have one stronger eye than the other, right? But right. You, you're striving. I mean, I'm not telling you to be ambidextrous. But on the other end, if you overly depend on your right hand, uh, then uh, you become more narrow in your use. It's good to give the other hand things to do. So okay. the, point is, the, the point is, no, it's not going to be even, but it may end up being more even use. Okay. My second question, thank you for that. My second question is, my vision is improving in my right eye. Um, and so I think... You know, sometimes it's better without the lens. I'm wondering what, when do I go back to the eye doctor for new lenses? And I mean, at what point do I decide that or choose that? Or should I do it as well, where, do you, where do you live, Karen? I live in Maine. Hi, ah, in Maine. Do you know of any uh, behavioral optometrist or um, any good optometrist that will be? willing to reduce your prescription to 2040? Um, 
actually, um, I, I did go to a behavioral um, optometrist and he just recently retired. And uh, so the nearest one is like two hours away. Oh, wow. That's terrible. That's I know. I mean, it's a small state. Right, right. It's a small state and it's two hours away, but the optometrist you need. Yeah. We have everything we don't need around us, right? Anyway, yeah. so what I want to say, Karen, is that um, uh, if you visited me, I'll send you to the optometrist in the city here, you know? But anyway, if you can find an optometrist, even a conventional one, and you say, look, I want to get 20, 40 lenses. Um, and the moment that he or she gives you those lenses, you adjust to them and work with them. Uh, like you put them in your pocket and you use them when you need to. And sometimes you can also use pinholes, um, but not for a long time, just 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Like you put them in the pocket, you walk in the street without glasses, then you put the pinhole to see a sign that you almost see, but can't actually see without glasses. Uh, that would make a very big difference for you. So I'm sorry about the logistics of things. It's not, if you drive for two hours, you'll see worse than if you didn't drive for two hours. No. So, well, one eye, one eye is uh, minus 600. The other one is like 20, 40 with astigmatism. And the astigmatism oh, is different. Well, then you need a lot to put obstructive lenses. Uh, we have obstructive lenses. So we, I know we have obstructive lenses here somewhere. Yeah. You need to put an obstructive lens around the eye that doesn't see so well for about five minutes, two or three times a day to start and use it. So again, I'm answering that question. Will they ever be equal? Most likely not. But will you be able to get the one that sees 2600 to maybe see 2100? And it's sort of being used, you know, a very small percentage to take 40 or 35% of use. And that's going to give you good vision for the rest of your life, basically. Mm. Yep. And if you wear this, the pinholes, you can put masking tape um, mm -hmm. or put a tape over the strong eye and with the weak eye, look with the pinholes, you know? Yep. So there's a lot of things you can do to get them to work more evenly. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Mayor. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. One more question. Sure. Right? Uh, Victoria has a question, looks like. And then a few people are asking about how to use the bunker ball. Ah, where's the bunker ball here? Um, We have one here. Uh, thank you. Well, we definitely have them in the front and the beach bag. Yeah. Okay. So, Victoria, I want to hear you. Ah, there's somebody to admit. Oh. He's running to bring the bung bunger ball. I wonder if somebody can unmute themselves in the same time. Okay. I'm, I'm in now. Um, I had a couple of questions, but they're both quick. One is, what's the youngest age we can start doing the exercises with? I have a four-year-old, almost four-year-old grandson who's got uh, a lazy eye and his parents are getting close to doing surgery, which I'm <laughs> working hard against. But So that's one question. Um, what age could he start doing this? The, the, the youngest one, age I had was a day. I had a kid, a baby that the, the infant that the uh, um, eyelid did not open, so I massaged and it opened, but I do work with babies. I do work with kids. It's so beautiful for me to see throughout the years, somebody that I saw uh, at the age of three months, I see that at the age of 14. And we have, we are continuing the work that we started. I saved his eye from extraction when he was a kid because all the doctors pressed for extraction. We stopped that. So at the age of four, there's no problem. It depends on the person, you know, I just yeah. now had the, uh, uh, 10 double session with somebody who is six, basically. Oh, yeah, I wish we were closer. Um, then the other question is, if you look at a, a like a really big painting of a landscape or a, a really big blown up poster of a beautiful scenery, is that like looking in the distance? Depends what distance you're standing from. So if you're standing, say, like, like six feet away and then you, you look at the, the landscape. Well, it's beautiful if you look at it. It's nice for your macula that you look at different details. 
but it's yeah. not the same thing for the lens. The lens specifically is made for hunting and for um, looking at distance. So it's not the same thing, but looking at a nice picture is always a good thing. So even if it has, say, mountains in the distance and you focused on the mountains, that's not... Uh, that's good thinking. work for your macula, for your retina. <laughs> But it's not the same thing for the lens, no. Okay, somebody had told me that a long time ago and it was like, I've, I've been wanting to ask you for ages and I keep forgetting, so thank you. All right, the HK. <laughs> All right, so um, this is wonderful for circulation. I love to um, uh, beat myself up a little bit with this bunger ball. Uh, the thing you can do with this, if you cannot do on your own so easily, is that you can hit yourself between the shoulders, right? And you can go around each shoulder. But I love it, especially for the thighs. You know, you step on your legs all day long and you do all kinds of um, work. And the more work you do with your thighs, the better. But hitting with bunker ball is so important. It's so useful. And that's why we have them here. So I just want to make the announcement that, again, that we have the Labor Day weekend. We definitely register people for it. It's a real opportunity to study my work in depth. People come from distance to do that. And it is three days, nine to five per day. And anyone who wants to come, we can also send you uh, uh, housing information, you know? So, um, yeah, good. So I would like to invite you all. Do you have a brochure that you can put on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. I really enjoyed working with you. Sorry that our internet collapsed. Let's hope that we solve it for the next meeting on August. Palming is a very, very powerful exercise. It leads to nurturing of the eyes by putting the hands over the eye orbits. In order to palm well, we must prepare our body for it. So moving the shoulders in rotating motion is a great idea. Palming is a great exercise and it leads to nurturing of the eyes. In order to palm well, you have to loosen up the shoulders so more circulation comes to the eyes. And then we put the hands very gently around the eye orbits without any pressure or tension on the eye orbits. So we sit and palm. And first of all, we watch our breath. 
it is so important to watch our breath. So as you sit in palm, you feel that the air gets deeply into your abdomen. The abdomen expands when you inhale and shrinks when you exhale. That your ribs expand when you breathe in and shrink when you breathe out. You visualize, because you can't feel that, that your head expands as you inhale and shrinks when you exhale. And truthfully, there is movement in the head that some osteopaths know, and what most people don't know, that as you breathe slowly and deeply, that movement is enhanced. The whole back expands when you breathe in and shrinks when you breathe out. Your pelvis expands as you breathe in and shrinks when you breathe out. Your thighs, your knees, your calves and your feet are all expanding as you inhale and shrinking as you exhale. Also, your arms expand when you breathe in and shrink when you breathe out. Your whole body becomes larger as you breathe in and smaller when you breathe out. No effort is being made. You just pay attention to my voice. It can come from one ear and move to the other ear. If you don't want to hear my voice, one of the things that you can listen to is music. You can listen to transformational tapes or recording. You can listen to anything that you want except your thoughts. Because that is the exact time when your thoughts are being put to rest and your vital forces, your energy, your blood flow, they all move to relax your eyes. The difference between one palming and another is phenomenal. And the dif difference between one person who does palming and another person who does palming is phenomenal as well. It should be your commitment to palm with the greatest neutrality there is. To be an empty vessel that listens to the world. So if you feel that your whole body expanded when you inhale and shrinks when you exhale, now it's time to feel that the whole world is expanding when you breathe in and shrinking when you breathe out. Your neighborhood, your state, your country, all the countries around your country, all your continent, the other continents, the oceans, all expand as you inhale and shrink as you exhale. That feeling doesn't make you self-centered, the opposite. That feeling makes you tune into what the world is doing with you. The wealth of the feeling that the whole world and eventually all the universe expands when you breathe in and shrink when you breathe out makes you one with the world you're in, makes you bless every moment that you're in. Your eyes are closed. A big, big part of the stimulation that comes to you is going away. And right now, you're listening to your breath. And you visualize that the whole universe becomes larger when you breathe in and smaller when you breathe out. Expands as you inhale and shrinks as you exhale. You breathe deeply 
and you breathe slowly. You breathe slowly and you breathe deeply. And you can be in awe of the world and you can thank every moment that you can breathe deeply. Why won't you count your breath? Count seven as you inhale. Count 10 when you exhale. And count 30 of those breaths. So let me count for you. As you inhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's important that you don't put any pressure on your cheekbones. It's important that your neck is straight. You don't bend and you don't bend in either way. You don't bend forwards or backwards. And that's why if you have the right pillows, it's great. But the best is palming stick, where you can adjust the height to that exact state where you don't bend your neck forwards and backwards, and you never ever put pressure on your cheekbones. Let me remind you, never ever put pressure on your cheekbones. Now breathe slowly in and breathe slowly out and enjoy connecting to all the universe, uh, universal forces. They're in you. They're in the universe and they're in you. And what you sense is how everything expands and shrinks. You visualize that every part of you expands and shrinks. You visualize that the whole universe expands and shrinks. Everything in the world breathes. Animals, stones, the earth, the sun, all the universe expands and all the universe shrinks all the time. So you visualize that everything becomes larger and smaller all the time. 